Good evening. Welcome to our Parsha Tidbits class. That's what it is. We're going to just take a few different subjects within the Parsha entitled Lech Lecha. This is a happy Parsha because we live with Abraham from the beginning to the end. We start off with Abraham and we end with Abraham. And anything that has to do with Abraham deals with white. It says in the Midrash, when Abraham came, his I mean, started to bring light into the world. The world was shrouded in darkness until Abraham. Even Noah, who was a righteous man, didn't bring light. He was righteous, but not light. Abraham was the first one to bring light. Abraham was 75 years old when he left from his hometown to go to the land that God says, I will show you. Now, 75, even in those days when people lived much longer, is still not a little child. It's still not a young man. It's a middle-aged person. Abraham had a long career before he was 75. Yet the Torah begins telling us the story of Abraham at the age of 75. Why? What happened before 75? Some very momentous things happened. His first and several tests that God tested him, we know there were 10 tests that he was given. There were different opinions about what they were. But everyone agrees that Abraham risked his life because he was an iconoclast. He destroyed his father's idols. He rebelled against idolatry. And he was thrown into a fiery furnace by the king, Nimrod. And he came out unscathed, miraculously, but he was prepared to die. That happened way before he was 75. And many other things that happened in his life before 75. And yet the Torah starts with 75. And there are many explanations, but one of them is that what happened when he was 75? God tells him to leave his land, his birthplace, and his father's house. That, for Jews, and for the future, is more relevant than being thrown into a fiery furnace. Sure, we, we certainly consider that heroic, that a person is willing to die for his beliefs. But that's not what Judaism is about. Judaism is not being heroic. That's Western culture. That's Eastern culture, not Jewish culture. Jewish culture is about living the way God wants us to live, which means to be prepared to change our way of life and to live in conformance with God's will. That's why God says to him, go from your land. The word land, Eretz, is related to the word ratzon, will. Go away from the things that you wanted before, your desires. From your birthplace, that's the very first verse, chapter 12, verse 1. From your birthplace, those are things that you develop, that are hereditary, that are innate, your your habits. From your father's house, from your upbringing. I mean, that's, we're a product of our of our uh, emotions, of our upbringing, of our char natural characteristics, leave all of that and go to a new land. Not heroic to move from one place to another. Everyone moves these days from one city to another. It's something that no one will ever know that he, that he went through a total transformation. But that's what Judaism is all about. It's about real change. And that is more important for us to know and that explains why he is our father, because we inherited that trait and that ability, more so than the ability to sacrifice ourselves for God, which is also part of Judaism. Unfortunately, many thousands, if not millions of Jews have given their lives for Judaism, but that's not the foundation of Judaism. Rabbi, what is it? We'll, take, we'll try to take questions near the end. Okay. Unless it's a very uh, quick question. Okay. Uh, God says to Abraham, Lech lecha, go to yourself. What does that mean, go to yourself? So Rashi, who gives a simple explanation of the text, says it means this is for your benefit. Lech go lecha, for your benefit. What's the benefit here? What is Abraham's benefit? So Rashi says that where you are now, you can't have children. Where you are now, you will not grow into a great nation. Where you are now, no one will know who you are. I am sending you to a place where you will become famous. Why does Abraham care to become famous? Not because he looked for fame and acclaim and glory. 
because that will enable him to fulfill his life's mission to spread the, va the values that he was the one to discover, the one God, a God who wants us to be just and kind, and that he needed to have an audience. You can't change the world if you don't have any recognition in the world. That was his goal. That's Rashi's explanation. I just read something very interesting, the story of Nachum of Chernobyl. Nachum of Chernobyl, everyone heard of Chernobyl because of the nuclear disaster, but Chernobyl got on the Jewish map as one of the most important cities in the world because the great Sadiq Rav Nachum, was in that, lived in that city. He was one of the senior disciples of the Margit of Mizrich. He was also related in Mechutin to the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad movement. He was older, but they married into each other's families. Rav Nachum of Chernobyl had many things that he did that made him famous and righteous. One of them was that he collected money to help redeem Jewish captives. It was not uncommon in those days for Jews to be thrown into dungeons because they didn't pay their rent or anything similar to that. So he would go around collecting money, and that would uh, enable him to save Jewish lives from captivity. Until one day he was in the city of Zhitomir, that's a city in, in, in the Ukraine, and he was arrested. Why? Because he was doing criminal work, collecting money, and he was thrown into prison. So here he's thrown into prison because he's collecting money to redeem prisoners. Well, he's sitting in prison, and then an old lady comes by, and she starts talking to him, and she says, it says in the Torah that Abraham was told by God to go to this land and this will be for his benefit. So she asked, what benefit did Abraham go, have from going, uh, leaving his homeland? Rav Nachman Chernobyl knew that this lady was not an ordinary lady. Somehow she gave him the impression that this was something, someone special. So uh, he didn't answer. He waited for her to give the answer. And she said something very interesting. She said, what was Abraham's claim to fame that we read about in the Torah? He was hospitable. Anyone who was homeless, anyone who didn't have a home, who was wandering from one place to another, and when you wander from one place to another, you're dis, you know, combobulated, and you need a place to stay, a place to sleep, a place to have a good meal. He provided that. But you can't really appreciate the good you do for someone unless you are in that person's shoes. So what did God tell Abraham? I want you to become a wanderer. I want you to feel what it's like not to have a home. I want you to feel what it's like to be dependent on others so that you will appreciate. That's the benefit. That's the reward that he was able to appreciate what he really did for other people because when he knew how other people felt. And she disappeared, this lady. Because she was telling Reb Nachum, why did you end up in jail? What did you do wrong? What was Reb Nachum's work? He was saving people from captivity, saving Jews who were captives. He couldn't really appreciate how much good he was doing until he became a prisoner. So God rewarded you that you should become a prisoner, just like Abraham was rewarded that he should become a wanderer so he should be able to appreciate what he does for others. And then the way the story goes is that Rav Nafim of Chernobyl realized that that woman was not other than Sarah Imenu, the matriarch of Sarah, who came from the other world and explained to him why he was suffering in prison. So that's the benefit that Abraham had, the benefit to appreciate what it is to need to be helped so that he could appreciate how much good he was doing by helping others. But the simple meaning of it, this would give him the ability to spread the message that there's one God. There's another Hasidic interpretation of the word Lech Lecha, the very first verse, chapter 12, verse 1. Lech Lecha, if you translate it literally, sometimes the deepest meanings are the literal translation Rashi explains to Lech Lecha, go for your own benefit. But the Hasidic interpretation is Lech, go Lecha to yourself. Go to 
who you really are. Where you are now, that's not the real you. The real you, you will discover in this land. What does God tell him? To leave everything and to go to the land that I will show you. Well, did God tell him which land? No, it doesn't tell him which land. So first of all, why didn't God tell him which land? Second of all, how did he know which land to go to, that he finally settled in Israel? So it could be we don't have all the information. The Torah doesn't give us everything. Maybe God eventually told him where to go. And it doesn't say that in the Torah. That itself is significant. So the first thing is that when God wants you to do a mission, if he has to take you by your hand and do everything for you, then you're not doing it. God is doing it. God wants you to do something. That will help you. He'll give you clues and hints, and he'll prod you, and he'll support you, but you have to do it on your own. I just heard someone mention this idea that the Moshem Tov, when he would travel, would travel miraculously. It means he would go into the wagon, they would tell the coach driver, who was not Jewish, to turn his back from the road so he shouldn't see the road. He would fall asleep, and the wagon would just fly over cities, and he would end up hundreds of miles away within a few hours. That was called Kfitzus Hadera, jumping over the, the, the road. But in order to do that, they had to first go out of the house. They had to harness the horses. They had to go on the wagon. And they had to have a coach driver who would sit there with his back. But if God was performing this miracle, why couldn't God just take them from where they were and just transport them? Because that's not the way we do. You have to do your own thing, your own effort. There's a story in the Talmud about Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, who was one of the great Talmudic sages, that he was so poor that he had nothing to bring to Jerusalem. Everyone else is bringing their big, fat oxen to sacrifice in Jerusalem, and he had nothing. So he sees this huge rock. He says, you know, I want to bring this rock, to, but I can't carry the rock. So the angels told him, just put your finger on it, and we'll carry it for you. And they did. But why did he have to put his finger on it? Because God says, you have to do your part. And one other story, contemporary story, there was a great chassid, many people knew, and I knew him, not personally, but I knew of him, very famous, Reb Mendel Futterfass. He was uh, in Siberian prisons for many years, and spread Judaism all over the Soviet Union, and because of that he was arrested. And one day, he, things were so bad that he felt that this might be the end. So he decided to send a message to the previous Rebbe. But what kind of message? The communists were not exactly going to deliver his mail, so he was going to send a telepathic message asking for a blessing. So he leaves his wherever he was sleeping, wherever he was incarcerated. He goes outside, walks over to the gate, the entrance, which was, of course, locked, and then he sends his telepathic message. When he came out of Russia, and he was reunited with his wife, who had left Russia years earlier, and lived in London, she showed him a letter from the previous Rebbe dated that day, saying that I received your, your letter, and I uh, gave him the blessing. It means that the Rebbe picked up his message and sent a response. So the question he said himself, why did I have to go outside, walk up to the gate, and then send the message? He says, I could have sent it from my bed. He says, because no, you have to do your part. He went as far as he can go to get as close to the Rebbe he can go, and when he came to the gate and the gate is locked, he had to rely on, on some something beyond the natural order. And the same thing is uh, true with with every effort that we have to make. We have to do our part, and God takes takes over. Mm -hmm. So that's why God doesn't tell Abraham where to go. God wanted him to sweat a little. See, if you could figure it out yourself. As, as you're going, I will give you hints. What was the hint that Abraham had to know? So the Medrash says that he went through many different areas, and he saw the people sitting on their porches, yapping, yakking, or whatever, <laughs> uh, drinking beer, talking about politics and sports, and doing nothing, <laughs> protesting. But no, they were not productive. 
So he says, this couldn't be where God wants me to be. This is a place that has no future, has no potential. It comes to the land of Canaan. Now, Canaan was not a nice land in terms of the inhabitants. They were idolaters. They were immoral. But he saw them planting and and tilling the soil and working. They had a work ethic. Ah, this is the place that God wants me to go to. So what we see from this is that you, you have to have something going in order to be able to cultivate the land. You can't just go into a place that's barren, that has no values, and try to create something. And unfortunately, in parts of our communities, we have people who have no sense of purpose in this world. So even a, an idolater, even a immoral person, if he has a sense of purpose, a virtue of the fact that he's going to work, then there's some hope that you could transfer that person's idea of what purpose is to something higher. You could let him grow in his pursuit of purposefulness. But if the person has no sense that his life doesn't matter, doesn't mean anything, and is there, he's, just, he's just living by virtue of breathing, then what are you going to do? You can't, you know, you did, you could, Abraham could never have succeeded in those places initially, of course. Okay, so Abraham takes off, and among the things that God promises him, I'll make you into a great nation in verse 2. I will bless you, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. So Rashi says, what was the second blessing about? I'll make you a great nation means you'll have children, and you will have uh, descendants. I will bless you, Rashi says, with money, because you can't really do very much without resources without money even in those days certainly in the modern times uh as much as we like to malign money let's say the pursuit of wealth is such a negative thing it happens to be the only way you can really accomplish things in influencing other people you have to have resources so god promises it promises him that he will be a great nation he will have money and he will be a source of blessing and I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And everyone will bless, be blessed by you. Okay, Abraham leaves. He's 75 years old. He comes, he travels with his nephew Lot. And they go to this land of Canaan. And not too much after that, as he's traveling south, in verse 10, there's a famine in the land. And Abraham has to descend into Egypt because the famine was very heavy. So here we have two opinions if Abraham's going to Egypt was right or wrong. What do you think? God tells him to go to this new land. He's there. No sooner does he come there or soon after. We don't know how much time he lasts, but it doesn't seem that there's very much time. There's a terrible famine. People are dying of starvation, probably. And he leaves the land to go to Egypt. So Rashi says that that was all right. That was one of his tests to see if he'll, if he won't complain to God. God, you told me to go to this wonderful land, and this is a horrible land. Look what's going on. There's a terrible famine. Abraham didn't complain, and he went to Egypt. But there was nothing wrong about him going to Egypt. That's the simple understanding. Rashi gives us the simple straightforward. On a simple level, what what did he do wrong? There's a famine, you go where there's food. As soon as the famine is over, you come back. But Ramban, Nachmanides, goes a little deeper than Rashi and gives you a more spiritual way of looking at it. It says this was a terrible defect in Abraham's part. He should have had trust that no matter what, Terrible famine. God wants him to be in Israel. He would be in Israel and not leave. And because of his leaving Israel to go to Egypt, his wife was abducted and she went through a very harrowing experience. And as a result, this portended the exiling of the Jews, of his descendants, into Egypt. Just like he went to Egypt, his children would have to go and become slaves in Egypt. So what Abraham did was actually denigration. He went downhill, and he shouldn't have done that. That's how Nachmanides explains that. The Rebbe, in a long discourse, explains that 
a person of the caliber of Abraham is not a sinner. So what it means that he went down, yes, he did go down, but it's not the way sinners go down. A sinner goes down, the sinner says, you know what, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyhow because I want to do it. I'm driven to do it. In the case of Abraham, it God gave him that idea to go down because a tzaddik, a righteous person, can't grow unless, like everyone else, you have to be down, and then by being down, you hit rock bottom, you can propel yourself upward. The lower you go, the higher you can jump. When a person wants to jump, he has to crouch. He goes down, he bends, and then he jumps. Well, that's what life is like. You have to somehow have a decline in order to grow. But tzaddikim don't decline on their own, so God puts them in positions where they're forced to decline, and that's the way they grow higher and higher. So that Abraham was put into this position as a way of growing higher and higher. Doesn't what the Alter Rebbe say, though, is that by going down and then propelling yourself up, you go up higher. You, you give the greatest pleasure to God. Yes, you do. But a tzaddik doesn't go down on his own. If you tell a tzaddik, you know, can you do a little sin here because uh, you want to grow? You have to sin a little and do tshuva and repent. I can't sin. It's against God's will. So God pushes him down and causes him to do something that is beneath his level as a way of in propelling him to go higher and higher. Now, what happens? He comes to Egypt and he says to his wife, Sarah, you know what? You're a beautiful woman. The Egyptians will see you and they'll know that you're married to me. They'll kill me and they'll let you live. So let's play a little game over here. You tell them that you are my sister and they'll uh, be good to me and they'll, I'll live. I won't be killed. So the first question, the obvious question is the Egyptians, why would they have to kill him? They could just take Sarah as they did and bring her to Pharaoh and not kill him. But that's adultery. Oh, adultery is wrong. Oh, you mean the Egyptians wouldn't commit adultery, but they would commit murder? So the Rebbe, one of his discourses in the letter, actually, gives us a short answer, and, it, and he shows the halachic implications. If you have a choice of doing two sins, one or the other, you, you don't have any other choice. You have to do one. Someone puts a gun into your head and says, either you do A or B. Well, you have to decide which is worse and do the lesser of the two evils. What happens if A is a bigger evil, but you'll do it once and you'll be over with it? B will be continual. You'll keep on, have to keep on doing it. So which you do? A biggie, a one-time biggie, or a re repetitive, smaller crime? One-time biggie. Yes, so that's what the authorities say. Do the biggie because it's only one time thing rather than doing a lot of small sins repeatedly. That's what the Egyptians were very good Talmudists. They said, if we take her now, then we're going to be committing adultery all the time. And that's, we don't, we don't want to do that. But if we kill him, it's a one time sin and that would be the end of it. But I think there's a simpler way of explaining it, a more down to earth it's not actually it's not even more down to earth it's harder to understand but it's a reality that's why we, we can relate to it every evil person and every evil government that does the worst type of evil always finds a way of legitimizing it and saying that it's kosher mm -hmm. for example the communists they would torture you until you would sign a confession that you committed the crime so I always wondered if they had to torture you to sign the confession, they could have signed it for you. They could have done to you whatever they wanted because they did torture you without your confession. But they had to be legal. It has to be kosher. Even the Nazis, you know, find legal, legal ways of legalizing the most heinous crimes that they committed. And the, there's a Kabbalistic reason for that. Evil can't exist on its own. It has no energy. It has to siphon off energy from the powers of holiness. 
and it manifests itself that would even even when evil is done, it always tries to find something to make it a little bit more kosher. So the 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 Egyptians they felt very they would feel guilty about committing adultery. So they would have to, you know, find a way of making it kosher. Yeah, but he's dead. What can we do? The fact that they killed him, at least in their in their hearts, they felt See, we're good people. We're not committing adultery. But the stranger part about all this is, it seems that Abraham is very callous. They say that you're my sister, so they'll give me, they'll, they'll let me live. And then Rashi says, and they will be good to me. They will give me gifts. You mean your wife is being abducted and you're thinking about the gifts you're going to get. It, it, I'm surprised it doesn't say, and they'll wrap it in a nice ribbon, and you know. <laughs> I mean, why was he concerned about gifts? And the part that Sarah, he wasn't concerned about Sarah. The Zohar says Abraham knew that Sarah was superior to him in righteousness, so he knew nothing will happen to her. He was so confident that God will perform a miracle that Pharaoh would not be able to touch her. Well, he was he was confident but cautious. Cautious about himself. He, he was cautious about her, too. He hit her to begin with. Right, because that, Rashi says he hit her in a box. What? Even though he knew they are going to open it. The, 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 uh, it wasn't custom. He tried to... He, he said, but okay, that ties in with what I said before. You do whatever you can do in a natural way. That's your part. I'm doing something to protect her. The fact that the odds were they're going to open the box, the tax collectors that were no different then than they are today. Customs, they open the box. So then... He says, I know God is going to protect her. I did my part. God will do his part. He wasn't so sure about himself. That's why he was focused on his own safety. But why is he talking about gifts? Okay, safety, I understand, but why gift? So the Rebbe explains he wasn't interested in those gifts. In fact, he never used them. He gave them years later, decade later, to his sons that he sent away. He gave Isaac everything he owned but he gave gifts to his sons. What were the gifts? The things that he got from Pharaoh that he never wanted to use. He didn't want to touch it. So then why did he take it? Why did he look for it? Because God promised him that he would give him money. He would bless him with wealth. So he's thinking to himself, oh, now I understand why this happened, why there's a famine, why I was forced to go to Egypt, and why this whole story would happen, that my wife would be taken. It's obvious this is God's way of fulfilling his promise. He didn't care about the wealth, but if God said he's going to give him wealth, he said, I figure this is the way. So therefore, I can see how it's, how it's working out. I see how everything is coming together. They're going to give me gifts because this is the brother of the, of the queen. Pharaoh would take her as a wife. So he says, now everything makes sense. He was just looking at his experiences as ways of understanding God's actions, not that he cared for this, for this well. One of the prizes that he got from Pharaoh was Pharaoh's own daughter, Hagar. Hagar was Pharaoh's daughter, and that's why later on, who did he give the gifts to? To Hagar's children. He says, I got it from your father. I'm giving it back to your children, to, their, to Pharaoh's grandchildren. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Okay, then it says that Abraham went on his journeys, continued on his journeys. In chapter 13, verse 3, he went from the Negev, the south of Israel, which is near Egypt, until the place called Basel, to the place where his tent was originally, but it says he went on his journeys. What does it mean he went on his journeys? It should have just said, and he traveled from the Negev to wherever else he went. What does it mean he went on his journeys? So Rashi says when he returned from Egypt to the land of Canaan, he would stay in the same inns that he stayed at when he left Egypt. He didn't change his hotel. To teach you proper comportment, that a person should not change the place where he stays. In other words, it's just to be faithful and loyal to the to the 
places that you uh, benefit from, to be to patronize the same people, not to always look for a, a better bargain. If you have a certain loyalty, you go to a certain store, to a certain doctor or whatever, you try to keep, be faithful to that to that person. That's one explanation, because the Torah is talking about Abraham. Obviously, he wants us to learn lessons from Abraham. And by saying that he went on his journeys, trying to teach you some moral lesson. The moral lesson is that he was faithful to the people who he benefited from. Another explanation, Rashi says, on the way back, he paid his debts. He had to borrow money. Abraham wasn't rich when he went to Egypt, so he had to borrow money. On the way back, he stopped off in all the places where he borrowed money, and he repaid his debts. So there's a Hasidic interpretation about payment of his debts. I think it's the one of the Gary Rebbes who says this. What was the debt that he incurred? People were asking him the question, why does God do things, suffer, cause suffering to good people? You're such a righteous man, Abraham. God tells you to go to this land. You leave everything behind. And now there's a famine and you have to go to Egypt. And he had no answer. What could he answer? You know, the quest, the perennial question, why the bad things happen to good people? And he was the, 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 the pinnacle of, good, of goodness, the epitome. And here he's going through such suffering. So he had debts. He couldn't answer the questions. On the way back, he was able to pay all his debts. He says, look how rich I am now. Look how good things are for me now. So he was able to pay his debt. But even when he left the land of his father, he was giving gifts, right? He was Nimrod gave him gifts when he left. Even Eliezer is his uh, faithful servant. Right, he had some things. He wasn't totally destitute. But the fact that God had to bless him with money means that he got a lot richer in Egypt. So... He was able to answer all those questions. I think we could add another point. The Hebrew word for debts is hakafos, which is the same word for the dancing on Simchas Torah, called hakafa. Oh. It means going in a circle. But that's what a debt is. A debt is Ruvain gives Shimon money, and Shimon gives it back to Ruvain. It's it's a circle. So the Rebbe Rashab whose birthday is in the month of Cheshwin, said that in Simchas Torah, God gives us blessings on credit. That's hakafos. We incur a lot of debts. He gives us blessings upon blessings. And the rest of the year, we pay our debts. So that's the same idea. Abraham was teaching us that you get a lot of great things from God, but then you have to start paying your debts, which is what Abraham did wherever he went. He spread the message of one God. But Abraham had a nephew who tagged along with him. And his nephew and Abraham both became very wealthy with a lot of cattle. And then they had to separate. Why? Because there were arguments between the shepherds of Abraham and the shepherds of Lo. What were they arguing about? Abraham's shepherds were taught to be honest, not to let the sheep graze in foreign lands. Lot's shepherds were taking advantage, saying... Ah, we can do whatever we want. So Abraham tells him we have to separate. And the words that are used for separation, the Baal HaTurim, one of the commentaries on the Torah, says that if you take the last letters of those four words, it spells the word Shalom. This is Ish Mi Al Afu. It's in verse, in chapter 13, verse 11. It says, and Lot traveled from the east, and they separated one man from his brother. So if you take those four words and you spell the, take the last letters of those four words, it spells the word Shalom. If you take the word Avram as well. So the Balaturim says, sometimes the only way you can have peace is by separation. And sometimes separation is needed to create peace. Then, 
God tells him that he's going to have many children as the dust of the earth. Just like the dust couldn't be counted, neither can his children be counted. And he tells him to walk the length and the breadth of Israel because I'm giving it to you. Okay. Then there's a war between four kings and five kings. One of the five kings was the king of Zdom, one of the nice places on the, on the map. And Lot, who lived in stone, was captured by the four kings. And Abraham goes forth with 318 of his men, and they defeat the four kings who were very powerful, and they redeem Lot. And the king of stone was so impressed with Abraham that he offered to give him the booty. Just give me the souls, the people, and just take anything you want. And Abraham says, no, I won't even take a shoelace. In chapter 14, verse 23, I will take no shoelace or a, a thread or a shoelace. And you shouldn't say, I made Abraham rich. So the question is asked. He didn't say that to Pharaoh when Pharaoh gave him gifts. He didn't say that to Pharaoh. I'm not going to take even a shoelace from you. He took the gifts. Okay, he didn't use it, but he still was rich. He owned that much. He had that in the bank. That when he was able to repay his debts, he, I guess, where did he repay it from? From what, Ape, what Pharaoh gave him, I assume. And later on, he, I guess, he put it back in the in the in escrow for his, for his Hagar's sons later on. Whatever the situation was then, he was willing to take it from Pharaoh. So why was the king of Sodom worse? You could say, well, Sodom was more depraved than Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you see, had some decency after he was punished by God, but he still, you know, felt a little guilty and he wanted to, wanted to uh, compensate for the pain and the suffering. K King of Stone had a different motive. What was Stone's evil? Stone was evil in that they would not tolerate any guests. If you were a guest in Stone, you right, say, they hated people from the outside. Yeah. What? Immigrants, they hate it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, legal or illegal immigrants. They hated all immigrants. Why did they hate immigrants? Because the immigrants would take away from their wealth. They wanted the wealth for themselves. But Lode moved there, and they didn't do anything to him because Lode brought them wealth. He was a wealthy man. Oh, we're going to get your wealth. Sodom's attitude was, we will only tolerate you to the extent that you could become ours. That we will exercise control over you and you are going to be part of our, uh, our world. We'll swallow you up. That's why uh, the Midrash tells the story that in their hotel, their luxury hotel, they would give you a bed. If you were six feet tall and the bed was five foot six... They would cut you down to size to fit the bed. If you were six foot six, if you were five foot six, they would stretch you to the six feet. If you were six foot six, they would cut you down to size, rather. What is that? I mean, it, we can take that literally. They were cruel, but there are so many other ways of being cruel. Why, did, why is that used? Because it's a metaphor. You were only welcome to the extent that you could fit into their bed, into their frame, that you could enhance their greatness, their wealth, their reputation, their well-being, to the extent that you were a little bit of an independent being, and especially if you would take something from them, no, no, you had no right to exist. So when Abraham would take something from the king of Zdom, what would that mean? That he was swallowing Abraham, that Abraham would become an honorary sodomite, so that I don't want. Pharaoh chased Abraham out and says, get out of here. I don't want you here anymore. I suffered from you. Pharaoh was not a hoarder. He has to have everything. He has to own everything and own everyone. The king of Zdom, he was someone who wanted Abraham in his orbit. So I'm paying you off. I'm giving you the, the resources, the booty. But meanwhile, you will become mine. That's why Abraham says, I don't want you to say, I made Abraham rich. 
which means he's taking credit for Abraham's wealth. Then God has reveal, reveals himself to Abraham and he takes him outside. He promises him a child and he takes him outside and he to count the stars. So Rashi says, what does it mean he took him outside? Simple means he took him outside to see the stars because you don't see stars inside the house. But the Medra says that he took him above the stars. Mm. The astrologer said, Abraham, you cannot have children. And God says, let me take you above the stars. You're not governed by the stars. You will have a child. He proved the astrologer's wrong. And just today I read a story. There was a guy, a Polish Jew, of Rome, Baron Holt, something like that. Edward grew up in a non-religious home, and he posed as a Polish person, and he was spared the horrors of the Holocaust, lost his whole family, but he survived. And then he came to Belgium, and he was still uh, posed not as a Jew, as a, as a Pole, and he went to this astrologer, and the astrologer, he gave him all the information. I guess he was trying to figure out about his life, about his future. And he gave everything, his birthday, and all the things that astrologers look at. And the astrologer says, you're dead. You were killed in the war. Based on what you're telling me, you're, pro you must have, you're probably not telling me the accurate information because you're dead. He says, no, I, everything I told you was accurate. Oh, then you must be a Jew. <laughs> so he was like shocked. Here, no one guessed he was a Jew. The Germans couldn't guess that he was a Jew. And here, this tr total stranger, within a minute, figures out he must be a Jew. So he started getting interested in astrology, and he went to France, I think, and he started studying astrology. And part of the course was they had to do a, uh, a uh, description of some individual, and they were supposed to interpret it based on astrology. So he took himself. And based on what he had learned... He was dead. He was killed in the war. And he showed it to his teacher. And the teacher says, yes, you're dead. If this, is, this person is dead. He said, but it's about me. And I'm alive. He said, well, you must be a Jew. <laughs> I, I never heard that story before. But the story illustrates the fact that we are not governed by the rules of nature. So whether you believe in astrology, as did most rabbis, or you don't believe in astrology, as did the Rambam, who didn't believe in astrology, we do believe that there are forces of nature. And the Jew is not governed by those forces of nature. That's what God was telling Abraham. I thought I, thought I read that, uh, that Hashem told uh, Abraham that directly. As he said, you're going to be a great nation. You're going to have kids. And Abraham says, I'm an old man. I saw in the stars that I'm not going to have any children. It doesn't say that Abraham said that. Yeah. No. God... God, but God says, God, that's what Rashi quotes the Medlish. God says, God says to him that forget about the, your astrology. I said, you're going to be a great nation. Right. Well, that's exactly what Rashi says. And one, according to one version of Rashi, Abraham was the first astronaut. He literally picked him up above the stars and he said, you are not governed by nature. You're above nature, which answers the question, why is it that Abraham is considered our father? Abraham had a father as well. Hatera, Hatera had a father, going back to Noah, going back to Adam. So why do we start the line at Abraham? Because the natural order says that Terah had no, that Terah had no grandchildren. Abraham was the first of a new line, because Abraham could not have children. So Abraham's father and his grandfather, that line ended with Abraham. Abraham was the beginning of a new dynasty, of a new order. That was no longer, the, the original order was no longer valid because naturally he couldn't have children. Then God makes a covenant with him between the pieces. And he cut up different pieces of meat and the covenants that would cut up things and he would walk between them as a sign of, of friendship. And then it says that Sipar, the bird, they didn't cut. One of the interpretations is the bird symbolizes the Jewish people. While all the nations of the world can be cut up, the Jewish people cannot be. They are an eternal people. In fact, the word sipar, uh, bird, is a uh, symbol of peace. The Jewish people have this 
state of peace, of permanence. And uh, it also is the gematry of this is Mashiach. Depending on how you spell it, there are different ways of spelling it. That the bird is the symbol of Mashiach, that no matter how much Jews will suffer, which is what God told Abraham, in the end, the, the Mashiach will take them out of their misery. At the end of the parsha, the Torah tells us how we have a child uh, through Hagar. Why did he marry Hagar? Because Abraham was childless. So Sarah says, take your handmaiden, Hagar, Hagar. And Hagar turned out to be not a very nice co-wife of Sarah. She taunted Sarah, so Sarah had her thrown out of the house. And uh, it says some very uncomplimentary things about Yishmael. Yishmael says, will be a pera adam, a wild man. His hands will be in everything, and everyone's hands will be in him. So uh, this came true in throughout history that the descendants of Yishmael, or those who purport to be descendants of Yishmael, are the ones who are creating a lot of problems in the world. The end of the parsha, Abraham is 99 years old, and God says, I want you to become perfect, and I want you to perform the mitzvah of circumcision. And not only you, but all the males in your house, which he does, the age of 99. And God changes his name in the process from Avram to Avraha. The question is asked. The Talmud says, based on biblical verses, that Abraham knew the Torah, the commandments, and he kept them. He fulfilled all the commandments, even though he was not commanded to do so. There was one commandment that he obviously didn't do until he was told by God at the age of 99, circumcision. Because had he circumcised himself before, you can't re-circumcise yourself. Right. So the question is, why didn't he do the mitzvah of circumcision if he did everything else? So the simple answer is, duh. The simple answer is, well, he did everything else. <laughs> Kill, duh. Okay. The simple answer is, it's a greater mitzvah to do that which you're commanded to do than the mitzvah you do voluntarily. When you're commanded to do a mitzvah, that mitzvah connects you to the commander. That doesn't square with what you said before. When you do a mit well, we'll soon see. When you do a mitzvah voluntarily, it's your own initiative which has limits. So there are certain mitzvahs, or at least one mitzvah, that if you do it once, you can't do it again. So Abraham didn't want to do this circumcision because he felt if I do it, and then God will command me to do it, it'll be too late. I won't have the advantage of doing a commandment. Eating matzah, for example, you can do it as many times as you want. So I can do it voluntarily, that if God wants me to do it, he'll tell me to do it, I'll do it again. A circumcision you can only do once. Now what's the contradiction? When he, was, when he left his home, he went to an unspecified location. Which the logic of what you just said would be, all right, I will tell you then where to go. It's a high mitzvah to follow my instructions. But that God didn't tell him exactly. God was telling him, you have to figure it out yourself. And so that was an incomplete and vague. It wasn't. It, it was, yeah, it was vague. It was vague. And yet here it's, it's very specific. Right, because here God wanted him to have, the Rebbe explains, one mitzvah that was different from all the other mitzvahs that he did. So we can be a paradigm for the future. What is the difference between Abraham's mitzvahs, uh, uh, for that matter, anyone who did a mitzvah before Sinai and after Sinai? A mitzvah you did before Sinai couldn't change the world. The spiritual and the physical had to remain two separate entities. So a mitzvah you did just enhanced your spirituality, but it didn't affect the physical world around you. After Sinai, Every mitzvah we do changes the world permanently. It has an effect on the very physical aspects of the world. But in order to give us the ability to do our mitzvahs, the patriarchs had to pave the way. So they had to have at least one mitzvah that resembles our mitzvahs, that can actually change the physicality of the world. And that was the mitzvah of circumcision, where his actual flesh became 
imprinted, you could say, with God's seer, with God's imprimatur. So that's the mitzvah of circumcision. And Abraham did it at the age of 99. But it says that Abraham couldn't find a male because uh, they were all afraid to do it, I guess. So who was his male? God helped him with his self auto circumcision. I'm talking about auto circumcision. Took out the laser. There was a there was a right. There was a, uh, a Jew in Russia who became observant, and then he influenced a friend of his to become to become try to become observant. But before I had a chance to really teach him anything, this friend was conscripted and was sent to Afghanistan when Russia was in the Afghanistan. But one day this. Balchuva, who was really uh, himself a novice, gets a call from Afghanistan. Uh, how do you circumcise this? I read in the Torah about Abraham circumcising himself. How do you do it? <laughs> and he told him whatever he told him, and he did it to himself. I hope he did it the right way. <laughs> but that was that. That's what you call self-sacrifice. That's one term I would choose. I remember someone reminded me I was we once going from Crown Heights to Borough Park every Shavuos there would be a procession of a few thousand Hasidim at the behest of the Rebbe to go to other neighborhoods to bring joy to other neighborhoods and that one Shavuos it was raining cats and dogs and everyone was drenched to the core and we walked for about an hour and a half in that rain thousands of people, and I had to speak in that shul, and people were saying, wow, what self-sacrifice. So I got up there, and I told this story. I said, you want to know what self-sacrifice is? When you're in Afghanistan, you know nothing about Judaism, but you just read that Abraham circumcised himself, and you call your friend, how he, got, how he made a connection was also a miracle, and you do it to yourself. He said, that's self-sacrifice. For us, this is enjoyment. This is a heart." Holiday enjoying probably really got him out of battle. That could be. Uh, any questions? You forgot your question. No, I remember I was gonna make a comment actually when yeah. you said that Abra, you know, that Judaism doesn't look for heroes. Judaism looks for observance. And to me, it seems to me that Abraham was the ultimate hero because Abraham was the first Jew when he was a trailblazer. Right, but I mean, the type of hero was to everybody else. Well, yeah, we. The, 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 the truth is that if I would have to rephrase what I said, I would say Abraham was the true hero, someone who's willing to go in the forefront of the army and fight and risk his life. That's a dramatic form of heroism. That's a Hollywood form. Not to diminish its importance, its value. I mean, I, I don't know if that many people are willing to die for their cause, but that's not. The heroism of Judaism, the Judaism demands of us on a daily basis. The Torah wants us to be heroes in, the, in a quiet way, in an internal way, in a profound way, not just in an adventurous way, in a traumatic, traumatic way. Again, it doesn't mean that martyrs are not held in high esteem. They are, but that's not what Torah is about. Actually, the Hasidus says there's a difference between Abraham and Rabbi Akiva, who were both, um, Rabbi Akiva was a martyr. He just tortured to death. Rabbi Akiva, when he was on his, when they were, they were combing his flesh with the iron combs, he was saying the Shema. And the student says, Ad Khan, to such an extent? And he said, my whole life I was waiting for this moment. Now, Rabbi Akiva didn't deliberately do something to get himself killed. You're not allowed to do that. But his whole life, he had this passion for God that he wanted nothing less than giving his soul to God. But he couldn't do it himself because that's against the Torah. But when it happened, he was not complaining about it. He was, he was rejoicing. The Rabbi says that Abraham was in a higher level than Rabbi Akiva. Abraham did not look for martyrdom. Abraham looked to fulfill God's mission. 
If I if he needed to give his life, he'll give his life. Whatever was needed. Or even his son's life. Right, but he wasn't looking he wasn't looking for that escape to get connected to God the way Rabbi Akiva. Now, Rabbi Akiva was at a very high level, of course, but Abraham was even higher. And the Rebbe was intimating that that's where we should be. Not intimating, he was actually saying it very clearly. And that's how probably his father-in-law, who the Rebbe was so devoted to, who gave was prepared to give his life, wasn't seeking to give his life. He was seeking to bring God's purpose to this world. And if self-sacrifice was needed, so be it. Do you consider that like an example of nullification? nullification of yourself and to unite with God and as right. one. But that's not the ultimate in negating your ego. The ultimate negating your ego is to do what God wants you to do, not what you're, what you want to do because of your spiritual quest. The greater nullification of ego is not when you give give your life, but when you give be all you have to do what God wants you to do. That's a deeper form of of uh, self abnegation. Mm-hmm.